1 Samuel chapter number 20, a little present truth for the one body here tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 20. In this chapter, there's a king by the name of Saul. And God never wanted Saul to be the king, but the people wanted Saul to be the king. It was never the will and desire of God for Saul to be the king, but God lets people have what they want. Every time God lets people have what they want, contrary to what He wants for them, it always ends up hurting them. And Saul really hurt the people that wanted him to be their king. Saul has a son by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan didn't choose to be the child of this uh, king that wasn't the choice of God, but there he is. Not only is he, is he the son of the king that wasn't God's choice, but he's heir to his throne. He's in line to sit on Saul's throne when Saul's days come to an end, and surely they will. But things being in the mess they're in, the Lord looks past Saul and decides that one day he will remove that man and replace him with a man after his own heart. And how David, in so many ways, is a picture and a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jonathan stood at a crossroads of his life, and he said, I can walk in the ways of my daddy, his rule, his reign, his rebellion against God, or I can turn against my own father, the king, and give my heart and give my life to this man that God will put on the throne and give him an everlasting kingdom. And I've thought as I've read this chapter, and we'll read it together tonight, how true it is that this world is ruled by a king. He's the king of pride, Job calls him. He's the king over all the children of pride. He's not God's choice. He's man's choice. It's not God's will that this man be the God of this world, but he is. And God lets man have their own, their own God, their own Lord, their own leader. They've chosen a bad one. But I know one, one time in my life I came to a crossroads, maybe you did too, when I decided that king that's not God's king, that king that's not reigning by the will of God, he might offer me thrones and glory and riches and a palace and all of that. But there's another king I heard about. One day God's going to put him on an everlasting throne. And I decide to give my heart to that king. I decide to set, set my affection in the direction of that kingdom. Not the one that will perish, but the one that will stand forever. And I get reading through this chapter and seeing so many ways in which Jonathan pictures the life of a Christian who's decided, I don't want to follow the God of this world. I don't want what he has to offer me. I want to follow that king. They're going to call his name Jesus. He'll rule and reign at Jerusalem for a thousand years and then forever and forever on the throne of his glory. I want to go that way. And so many many things in this chapter point to our relationship to Jesus Christ after we turn our back on on this world and, and what the world tells us it has for us. And I want to talk with you about that tonight. Father, help me this evening to be a help to these people. Lord, I pray that you'd allow me to make clear to uh, those that have come tonight what you made clear to my heart. And I, I pray, Father, that it will strengthen our resolve and, and our faith that Brother Joel uh, spoke about this evening. Help us, God, we do ask and pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Uh, just, just one quick note about Brother Joel's message before we go. When I got saved back in 1976, that was a tail end of all the great revivals and the great end gatherings through the late 40s and all the way up to the mid to late 70s. I'm telling you, people getting saved and baptized and joining churches, it was, it was great going. But, but I, 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 and you hear about the rapture, and these men preach sermons about the rapture and how, man, all the industry would come to a halt and transportation come to a halt and, and how the world would, would change because all the Christians that were gone. I'm satisfied if the rapture happened tonight, the vast majority of places in this world would not know anything happened. But there are so few truly, genuinely saved and born again people Honestly, I mean, you think of our cities. Name me the city, the the Bible-believing churches in our cities. 
Uh, you think about the countries in this world that are, that are dominated by a religion that rejects Jesus Christ, and it's, it's the majority of them. Uh, you think about our, our media. You've got, they, they tell me now there's 900 to 1,000 television stations. You couldn't find a Bible preacher on one of them. Why? People aren't interested in it. When I got saved in our county, I could listen to six conservative Christian radio stations. I could listen to Lester Roloff six times a day, Oliver Green five times a day. Now, the last Christian radio station that plays preaching of any kind went talk radio last month. There's none left in all of Central Florida. I tell you, when the Son of Man cometh, she find faith in the earth. And I, I'm glad, I'm glad there's people here still true to Jesus Christ. I'm glad people in our church still true to Jesus Christ and other churches represented here tonight. But you know as well as I do, this getting, these little islands are getting mighty small in this great big ocean of sin and, and rejection of Christ. So I, I want to be part of that. I don't want to quit tonight and the rapture happen tomorrow. I don't want to give up next week and the rapture happen two weeks from now. I want, I want to be faithful right up till the time Jesus comes again. Thank you for that message, brother. Okay, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, uh, verse number 1. And David fled from Naioth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? And what is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? Did they not hate Jesus without a cause? Did they not put him on that cross for no good reason? They couldn't find two witnesses to agree together that said he'd ever done anything wrong. Judas said he's the innocent blood. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. And, 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 and David said, why, why does your father hate me? Why does he seek my life? Well, just because he's righteous. Because he's, he's true to God. That's why. And verse number 2 says, And he said unto him, God forbid. Thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Now, let me say something to you tonight. If you're a new Christian, this is going to be hard for you to believe. If you grew up in a Christian home and, and, and sheltered from the world, and I don't mean that to be critical. I just mean you, you've you been in church all your life and you've never set foot out there yet to work your first job or go off some school somewhere. Uh, and, and I'm just telling you the truth. If you're, if you're from a compromised and liberal church, you're not going to believe this tonight. Jonathan said to David, it couldn't be possible that the king hates you that much. It couldn't be possible that the king wants to rid the kingdom of your presence. It couldn't be possible that they would ever conspire to put you to death. Let me tell you something. You have no idea how badly this world hates Jesus Christ. You have no idea how bitterly opposed they are to the Holy Bible. They would destroy every Bible preaching church if they could. They would ruin the reputation of every Bible preacher if they could. They'd get every last young person out of every Sunday school if they could do it. They absolutely hate Jesus Christ. You'll find that out if you ever stand up for Him. If you ever start witnessing, if you ever start preaching in public, if you ever start knocking on doors and trying to win somebody to Christ, if you ever stand up in that college classroom and say, I believe the Bible, they'll try to run you off that school. I I'm telling you, this world, they are not neutral. They want you to think they're neutral. They're not tolerant. They want you to think they're tolerant. They're not broad-minded. They're not liberal. They hate Jesus Christ and the Word of God with every fiber in their being. I believe that. I don't think all these sodomites are sodomites. I think it's just a way to show rebellion against the Holy God. I think people just saying, oh yeah, God, you said that in your Bible, watch what I'm going to do. You said that's wrong, watch what I'm going to do. You, you said, I'm not allowed to do that. I'll do it and I'll parade it down the street. I, I, I believe this, this world, they just absolutely hate Jesus Christ. You want to stand for Jesus Christ? You can't, you can't love the world or want to be loved by the world. There's no, there's no option for that. No option for that. Verse 3. And David swore him over and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there's but a step between me and death. This world is opposed to everybody that's fallen in love with King Jesus. 
This world, would, if, if they could, the communists would kill all the Christians. The Muslims would kill all the Christians. The radical Hindus, kill all the Christians. The atheists, they'd get every, Christian, every last Christian out of the government, out of the school system, out of there. They'd shut you down in a minute. I'm telling you, I'm, listen, I, I'm, a, I'm not a gloomy Christian, I'm a happy Christian. I enjoy the Christian life. Our church is full of happy people who enjoy the Christian life. But make no mistake about it, you are not accepted by this world. You are not welcomed by this world. You are not wanted by this world. Has nothing to do with your hair, has nothing to do with your clothes, has nothing to do with your income, has nothing to do with the kind of car you drive. The minute you associate yourself with Jesus Christ... This world will turn on you and and try every way they can to shut you up. It's a fact. Verse number 4 says, Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. David said, Jonathan, your daddy hates me. I love you. Jonathan, your, your daddy's kingdom is hunting me like a criminal. I, Jonathan said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Da, da, David said, Jonathan, I'm telling you, they'll, if the first chance they get, they're going to kill me. Jonathan said, you just name it, David. You just, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Boy, that's good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, you know something? I, I, I have given up. I have given up on trying to get to the bottom of all the conspiracy theories. I have given up on trying to get righteousness in the, in the capitals of our governments. I have given up on trying to reform the school system. I have given up on trying to get lost people to act decent, uh, like, like normal human beings. I've given up on all that. Here's, here's, the last, here's all I can do in these, in these end times. In a world that hates Jesus Christ, in a society that hates the Bible, in a public school. Listen, I graduated in 1976 from public high school, and the girls that got in bed with the boys were ridiculed and called names and insulted, and now the girls that don't are ridiculed and called names and insulted. This thing's turned completely on its head. I'm telling you something, this world is shot it's gone. It is racing toward its doom. And I'm just going to step aside from every bit up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Amen. You just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do what you want me to do. That's all I'm concerned about. Yes, I can't save the world. I can't save the earth. I can't save the sea cows. I can't save the endangered plants. I can't save the icebergs. I can do what Jesus Amen. wants me to do and preach the Word of God and live for the Lord and love my family and teach the Bible. And that's what I'm going to do. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Man, we, 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 we lost our way. You say, what, what ended that revival? We quit knocking doors for Jesus and started knocking doors for conservatives. We quit preaching the gospel and we started preaching politics. You know it's true. I'm not going to name names. If you were, you were around in those days, you know what happened. You know what happened. We got big enough churches. We got enough people baptized. We got some schools started. We're on the television. Let's, let's get into politics. Let's straighten out the politics. How's that worked out for you? You know, you get enough people saved in a the town, they'll vote in the right people. You try and get lost people to vote for righteous people. That ain't going to work. Get people saved. The rest of them take care of themselves. Praise the Lord. Jonathan said, what, what do you want me to do? I'll just do whatever you want me to do. Look at verse number, uh, verse number uh, uh, 5. Uh, David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is a new moon. And I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field on the third day at even. If thy father had all missed me, then say David earnest to ask leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace, but if he very, be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldst thou bring me to thy father? Now he tells him two things. First of all, if you will take a good, close, careful look at Saul, you will find out that I have told you the truth about Saul. And then he said, and if you'll take a good, close look at me, you'll find out there's no iniquity in me. 
You know what the Lord wants you to do, young man? You're not sure yet. You're 19. You just got your first truck and you found out there's a radio in there and you can listen to things you couldn't listen to at home and there's gasoline in there and you can drive places that, that uh, you're not supposed to drive. And young lady, you, you know, you, you've grown up now. You're on your own. You got your own house and you're bringing your own children in the world. You don't have to do what mom and daddy says anymore. You don't have to do what the church says anymore. Sometimes you have to decide for yourself. Let me tell you what you need to do investigate Saul and you'll find out this world is exactly what God said it is. They're exactly what Jesus Christ said they are. Don't go out there and and have to prove it to yourself about drunkenness and fornication and adultery and drugs and nakedness and perversion. Just take God's word for it. But you want to go check it out? You'll come to the conclusion, the Bible's right. The Bible's right. It, it, they're just exactly what, what God said they were. And you take a good look at Jesus Christ, I'll tell you what you'll say. You'll say, I've examined this man. I find no fault in him. There's no iniquity in him. He doesn't lie with his tongue. He doesn't lust with his eyes. He doesn't mislead with his steps. Everything he does is righteous. Everything he does is holy. Everything he does is motivated out of lo- love for my soul. Why would I choose Saul when Saul's a murderer from the beginning when I could follow this man, David, in whom there is no iniquity? Iniquity. Why would you follow the devil? He's everything God said he is. He proves it every day, a million times over. In any life of any man, any woman follows him, he proves himself to be a murderer and destroyer. And everybody that gives their all to Jesus Christ said, I don't find one thing wrong with him. His book is wonderful. His music is wonderful. His life is wonderful. His teachings are wonderful. His heart is wonderful. His, his, you're the one. You're the one. Jonathan, said, Jonathan David said, going back, going back. You don't think Saul's bad as I say? He's going back to find out. Jonathan went back and he found out. And then he went back to David. He said, you know what? You were right, you were right about Saul. And I've come to see you were right about you. I'm going your way. I'm going your way. The Bible says in verse number nine, and Jonathan said, far be it from thee. For if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father upon thee, then would I not tell it thee? Then said David unto Jonathan, Who should tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? And Jonathan said, David, come, let us go out into the field. And so, so they made disagreement, and, and they're going to meet up once Jonathan finds out the facts of the matter. Now here's the next point I see in there. Jonathan not only decided his loyalty was going to be to David, not to Saul, but he said, From this day forward, Anything Saul tries to do to harm David, I'm going to let it be known. I'm going to declare it. I'll tell David about it, and I'll tell everybody I can. I'll tell him about it. You know, what I'm going to, you know what I intend to do? I intend to not just get saved. I intend, I intend to not just read my Bible in the privacy of my home. I, te- I intend to not just go to heaven when I die. I intend to tell everybody I possibly can what that murderous Saul is up to. What's in his heart, what his plans are, what his intentions are, what his desires are. I'm going to expose that rascal every chance I get. I'm going to say to our young people, this is what the world will do to you. I'm going to say to our married people, this is what social media will do to you. I'm going to say to our men, this is what pornography will do to you. I'm going to say to our women, this is what those talk shows on the TV are going to do to you. I'm going to expose Saul's intentions to destroy David. I'm going to make it known. That's what Jonathan said. He said, he's my, he's my own daddy. He's my, he's my flesh and blood. I was born of him. But I'm not, I'm not going to live out my days in accord with my natural birth and my first birth. I'm going to side with David. I'm going to expose Saul for the rascal that he is. And you know what's real interesting about this? Jonathan says, and David, I'll come tell you. And David already knew. David's the one that told Jonathan what Saul was going to say. David's the one that told Jonathan how Saul was going to act. And Jonathan said, you know what? If he says what you say he's going to say, I'll come tell you. If he does what you say he's going to do, I'll come tell you. Now, I, Brother Joel read that passage, start his message. And all those passages on prayer, let, let, let me, maybe my heart is different. Uh, he's a young man. I'm an old man. So we, we see things a little bit different. Uh, and I'm not saying anything wrong with what he said. I, here, here's what I know. God knows what's going on before I go and pray about it. 
God knows what's happened in my heart before I go pray about it. But what I see in, in these illustrations and what I see taught plainly in the New Testament is he still wants me to come and tell him. David, David said, now Jonathan, you're going to sit at that table and Saul's going to be angry. And if Saul's angry, you come tell me. And then Saul's going to say, he wants to kill me. And if he says he wants to kill me, you come tell me he wants to kill me. So here's what we do. It's prayer time. And we get down on our knees and say, Lord, uh, just, I'm just here to pray today. I just want you to know this world's a really bad place. Wow, thanks. Now I just want you to know, Lord, I'm, I'm really struggling. I, I got this old nature and it really tugs at me. Oh, that, I wondered what was the matter. Do you understand, when I take my burdens to the Lord, He knows what they are. When I take my cares to the Lord, He knows what they are. When I inform Him on what's going on in my life, now the enemy's fighting against me and against Him, He knows. But it is an evident token of our friendship and of our relationship that we talk about it. When you men get home from work at night and you, before you eat, before you throw your shoes in the, in the floor, before you sit down in your favorite chair, you know how you just tell your wife how beautiful she is and how much you love her and how happy you are that she's waiting there for you. You know why you don't? You say, well, she already knows that. But the fact that she already knows that doesn't mean that she wouldn't really like to hear it. Amen. I mean, Bring home some of that Song of Solomon stuff. Honey, your nose is like a cucumber. So, <laughs> your ears are like kites in the wind. You know, it's just all that. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not translated right. It just doesn't carry, somewhat just don't carry over too well. But listen, we, we talk to our wives about things they already know. Why? Because we're friends. We're in a relationship. Look at that. I can't believe how slow that guy's going. The light's green and he's still not moving. She knows that. <laughs> but we just want to tell her. Right. Come on, isn't it right? right? Sister, your husband knows he's a dummy. You don't have to keep reminding him. You, just <laughs> you can't do anything right. I know. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. <laughs> Why do we go to the Lord in prayer and tell Him things He already knows? Because that's what people do when they're in a relationship. That's what people do when they like each other. That's what people do when they're in love. I'm standing in the airport uh, waiting to get on on the plane, and I don't know what you do when you're in the airport. When I'm in the airport, I I just look and and say, she must not have a mirror. She must not have a mirror. She must not have a mirror. There's no no way they would have worn that out where all these people could see them if they had a mirror. Uh, (laughs) This off track, but I, I just like to pass this on wherever I go. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's two kinds of women that shouldn't wear yoga pants. You may want to write this down. The ones that look good in them and the ones that don't. <laughs> if you fall into either one of those categories, you shouldn't be wearing them. Anyway, so I'm staying in line at the airport. And these people are talking about the movie that they saw. They're total strangers. Have you seen such a movie? Oh, yeah. Did you see it? Oh, yeah. And then they start talking about what was in the movie. You both saw it. <laughs> oh, how about the part when the, when the, the, you know, the supersonic fighter came down and, and shot the, you know, the robot guys? In a, oh, yeah, that was so cool. It wasn't real. But they're telling each other what they already know and they're striking up this instant friendship because they both saw the same thing and know the same thing and wow, that makes them friends. Then you get off the plane and all of a sudden you're on another planet and nobody's saying hi, hi, hi. It's roll tide, roll tide, roll tide, roll tide, roll tide. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Just say to one of them, what does that mean? <laughs> you ain't from around here, are you, boy? <laughs> so. Jonathan loved David. And David was okay 
In fact, he was looking forward to Jonathan coming and telling him what he already knew. Because that's what friends do. You want to be a friend of the Lord? Just go tell him what he already knows. Tell him what's going on in your town. Tell him what's going on in your life. Tell him about your struggles. Tell him how Saul's trying to take you out. Tell him how the world's trying to destroy Christianity. Just tell him all about it and say, I just want you to know I'm not on their side. I'm on your side. I just want you to know I'm not participating in any of that. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Praise the Lord. Now look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, the Bible says, And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any time, or third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee, and show it thee, the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father, do the evil. Then I will show it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace, and the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father. You know what he's aware of? He's aware of the fact that God is listening in on every conversation he's a part of. When he 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 says, O Lord God of Israel, before he says, O Lord, he said, when I sit down at that table, I know God is listening to that conversation. When that conversation goes on that table, I know God is, is listening in to my response to that conversation. When I do what I do based on that conversation happening at the table, I know God is listening. Don't you think we'd talk different to our spouses if everything we said we started it with, Oh Lord God? Would we talk nicer? Would we hold our tongue? If, if, if before we started on our children, if, if we, Oh Lord God. Before we said, told that joke at work, if before we repeated that thing to, to somebody, yes, Jonathan said, I, I, I'm going to have some things to say. When I go sit at that table, I'm going I'm to remember, I'm sitting there, and God's watching. Yes, when I get up from that table, God's watching. When I go out that door, God's watching. Boy, that'd help us. Yes, that'd help us. We taught a whole generation or two now in America, they're evolutionary animals. God's not watching. And you wonder why you got the murder rate you do. You wonder why you got the drug problems you do. You wonder why you got the crime and the violence. I'll tell you what kept me from all that. God's watching. Man, my daddy taught me as soon as I knew anything. God's watching you, boy. My mother, God's watching you, boy. Our principal stood up in the auditorium first day of school, elementary school, said, I'm, I can't be everywhere. God's watching you. They'd fire him now. <laughs> you can't say that stuff. Boy, they, they wonder how to get the crime and the violence under control. But get God back in there. Yeah. All right, 14. And thou should not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou should not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. You know what he said? He said, I believe, I believe if I follow you, if I go your way, my life will be blessed. My life will be better. But I also believe that even after I die, my life will be better if I follow you. This isn't a temporary thing. This isn't a, a now thing. This is, he, he, see what he said? He said, and, and, uh, and uh, I should not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. He said, uh, after I, if I don't die, praise the Lord, bless me. But once I'm dead, I want you to keep blessing. Yeah. Now you can't get that from the devil. You can't get that from Hollywood. You can't get that from a ball team. You can't get that from a bar. Nobody's going to deny there's pleasure in sin for a season. But man, that season runs out. And with the Lord, there's everlasting blessings. Praise God. Jonathan said, I'm in on something. Why would I pick that king? Whatever I get from him is going to run out anyway. I pick this king. It's going to go on and on and on and on and on, generation after generation. Verse 17, he says, Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Here's, this is Saul's great deception. Saul's great deception in keeping you from being saved continues to be Saul's great deception after you're saved. That devil tells you you got this great life and you'll have to give up this great life if you become a Christian. And it's such a lie. But he plays on your self-love 
and gets you to believe that if you give up your self-love and fall in love with Jesus, you'll be the loser for it. Well, finally, finally, the Holy Ghost brings you to the end of yourself and, and you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and you get saved. And you start reading the Bible, and you start going to church, and then the preacher starts preaching on some things you're not so sure you want to do. And the preacher starts preaching on some things you're not so sure you want to give up. And here comes Saul again and says, well, you know something, if you love yourself, you ain't going to go out there knocking on those doors and let people see what a fanatic you are. If you love yourself, you're not going to dress like a little house on the prairie weirdo. Right? I mean, here comes the devil. What is it? It's the same lie. It's the same lie. Let me let you know a secret. If you really love yourself, the best thing you can do for yourself is love Jesus. Because there's nobody going to do more for your old self than Jesus Christ. Nobody going to offer you life more abundantly like Jesus Christ. And Jonathan said, Jonathan said, David, I just want you to know, I love you as much as I love myself. I love your soul as much as I love my own soul. You know, listen, but Joel Logan's not the perfect man. That was a good spot for an amen, but y'all held that back. <laughs> His daddy's closer. He's not the perfect man. Brent's not a perfect man. Tim Floor's not a perfect man. Listen, you know why Joel and his wife still going? You know why Brent and his wife still going? You know why Brother Tim is... Uh, we've seen so many people drop out. We've seen so many people quit. It's not knowledge. It's not opportunity. It's not income. It's not a lack of disappointment. It's not a lack of personal failure. If you love Jesus Christ in your soul, how can you spend the rest of your life with Saul? How can you go back and camp out in Saul's palace with death and murder and anger and wrath and insanity? That's Saul. The reason people drop out of our church is not because they quit believing in a King James Bible. They just don't love Jesus enough to stick around. Jonathan said, it's probably probably going to get bad for me at Saul's house. (laughs) And I see it's not going so well with you right now, living in caves and running for your life and all that. But I love you like I love my own life. And if I can stay here and love you, I'll do it. If I've got to go out there with you and love you, I'll do it. But I love you. That's, that's it. That's it. That's what's going to keep you going is loving Jesus. Now, verse 30. It, it happens at dinner just like David said it would. Verse number 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman. That's changed to cussing in the living Bible. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and under the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? If you've got a Christian, Christian grandparents and Christian parents, you don't have any idea how good you've had it in your life. Jonathan says, I'm going to follow that king that loves God and that God loves. And he became the instant object of hatred and ridicule on the part of his own flesh and blood. You're 18 in a public high school and you get saved and start living for Jesus. All of a sudden your friends are not your friends. You're 35 years old and a drunk, getting drunk with the family and kinfolk every 4th of July and every barbecue. And all of a sudden you say, I'm a Christian now, I don't drink anymore. They'll mock you, they'll ridicule you, they'll try to trip you up. They'll they'll wave booze under your nose. They'll do everything in the world trying to mess you up. Why is Saul so angry with Jonathan? Just because he loves David. Why is Saul cursing Jonathan just because he loves David? The world hates Jesus so much they'll hate you if you join up with him. And it won't just be strangers, it'll be people closest to you. They'll chip away at you, they'll try to cut the legs out from under you, they'll do everything in the world, get you out of church, get you back out in the world. Just a fact, just a fact. Jesus said if you don't hate your father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, even your own life, you can't be my disciple. He's not preaching hate. He's saying, they're going to hate you if you follow me, and you're going to have to decide. 
you willing to have a hate relationship with people that used to be close to you so you can walk with me? Or are you going to give me up and go back with them? That's where people drop out. 31. 31. Well, we don't like that part, do we? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established in thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. You know what Jonathan did? Young man, musician, piano player, athlete, college graduate. You know what Jonathan did? He gave up the opportunities he had for personal glory in order to associate himself with King David. Satan took Jesus Christ up on a mountain one time and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and he said, I, I can give it all to you. I have the power to give you all this. And Jesus said, no, no, I'd rather please my father. I'd rather please my father. Young lady, Satan has the power to give you everything in this world. There it is. Money, fame, fortune. You can be the next internet piece of trash. And the world's just waiting for one more crazy, silly, disgusting woman to sell herself on on the internet. You know what Jonathan said? I don't want anything you got. I don't even want the throne. I want David. What's wrong with you, son? Do you not see that? You would be the king. You would have servants. You would have riches. You would have slaves. You would have wives. You would have concubines. Your name would go down in history, son. What's wrong with you? Daddy, I know you're not going to understand this. I just just love David. Amen. I just love David. You know how many men I know and women I know have been written out of inheritances, been cut out of wills, been, been uninvited. They don't get invited to the weddings. They don't get invited to the funerals. They don't get invited to the 4th of July. They don't get invited to Thanksgiving dinner. They don't get to sit on a Christmas tree because the family's so afraid they're going to bring up that Jesus person. And you know where they are on Sunday morning? They're standing in the church singing songs of praise to God. Their heart's so full of joy and happiness. And the family that cut them off and hated them, they're just as miserable as they can be and waiting to drop into hell. Jonathan said, you can have your throne. I want David. You can have your riches. I want David. You can have all these things. I want David. I want David. How about you? How about you, young man, young lady? The Bible says in verse number 32, Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? You know what street preaching is all about? You know what public ministry is all about? You know what being a witness on your job is all about? You know what being a witness on a school is all about? In this generation... It's not all about winning souls, though I love it when we get to win somebody to Jesus Christ. It's not all about getting people to repent, come to church, and and live a new life, though it's such a blessing when that happens. You know what most of our ministry is about in these days? You're wrong. You're wrong. Jesus is holy. You're wrong. God is good. You're wrong. The Bible is right. It is just defending the honor of our Savior against those who blaspheme His name and want to rid our society of His very presence. I don't think Jonathan had any hope of converting Saul. I don't think he had any expectation of converting Saul. But he wasn't going to let Saul lie about David. Not if he was there. He wasn't going to let Solomon, uh, Saul falsely accuse him. Not when he's there. You can say that stuff when I'm gone. You're not saying that when I'm here. You're not going to curse Jesus in my presence. Curse Muhammad. Curse Buddha if you want to. Don't slam your thumb and take the holy name of Jesus Christ in vain. You get around these people. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. So was it prayer time? What? What? 
stand there and let people blaspheme the Lord. Mock Jesus, make fun of Jesus, criticize and ridicule Jesus Christ. You're going to sit there and watch it for entertainment? You're going to sit there and laugh at it because it's a comedian or a, a TV show? Come on, stand up for the honor of Jesus Christ. You're not going to talk that way about my Savior. You're not going to say those things about my Holy Bible. You're not going to insult my church like that. Jonathan took a stand, defended the honor of the one that he loved. Verse 33, And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Now, I've had a lot of things happen to me when I'm witnessing. That, that, that one hadn't happened yet. That'd be pretty rough, wouldn't it? Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. You think? <laughs> Why'd he hate him? He hates David. Why does he hate Jonathan? Because Jonathan loves David. The world hates Jesus. You know what he said? If they hated me, they'll hate you. They'll hate you. Why? Why? What have I done? I haven't lied to you. haven't stolen from you. haven't taken your wife. haven't molested your children. haven't hit you driving drunk. What do you hate me for? Well, that, that, that. What, I got a piece of plastic on my bumper with some words about the Lord? It makes you that upset? I get, I get two words, Jesus saves on a t-shirt. You're not upset about the guy with profanity on his t-shirt. You're not upset about the guy with, with filthy pictures on his t-shirt. What's wrong with this t-shirt? They just hate Jesus. You associate yourself with Jesus Christ, they'll hate you too. Man, you get in that store and it's all crowded and everybody pushing and jamming and, and shoving each other. Just put an open Bible in that little seat where the baby sits in the shopping cart. You'll have a whole out of yourself, man. They'll clear out. We supported a guy for years. He's in heaven now, but he, he's on deputation. He went to see Niagara Falls. And he got in that boat. They get this boat. They ride you right up close enough to get wet. Not so close. Boat goes under, you know. And, and he said, they, they put you on that boat, man. They just pack you in there like sardines. You can't move. You get, you, it's like jam pack elevator. So many people on there. He said, that boat got to go up that waterfall. I'm looking at that thing, and I'm feeling that power, and I'm hearing that noise. He said, it just came over me. He said, I just put my hands up. I said, praise you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. What a creator. Praise the Lord. And he said, when I got done, I couldn't touch anybody. He said, I, I could reach in every direction. And he said, I don't know how they moved, but they all moved. This world is no friend of the gospel. Not anymore, not anymore. This country has no respect for the Bible. Not anymore. In fact, what I see, what I see in our media, what I see in our entertainment, what I see coming out of our universities is an absolute hatred for Jesus Christ and for righteousness and for holiness. You're going to have to make up your mind. I cannot be popular in this world and a dedicated Christian. I cannot have the love of this culture and be a dedicated Christian. Jonathan said, I don't care what it costs me, Daddy. You can throw spears at me. You can try to kill me. You can hate me till the day I die. I'm going to love David. How about that? Verse 34. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Doesn't it hurt your heart the way people talk about Jesus? Doesn't it grieve your soul the way the people of your country mock and ridicule the things that are taught in the Bible? I hope it does. I hope it does. They hate us. I don't hate them. I don't want them dead. I don't want to destroy them. I'm not one of these people calling for the death of people that commit this sin or that sin. I don't want to call fire from heaven down, uh, fire down from heaven, burn up anybody. I want to see them all get saved. Boy, I tell you, we go home. It used to be, we, we're 30 miles from Daytona Speedway. We go, we go preaching the Super Bowl, Orange Bowl, uh, football games in University of Florida and and, and Jacksonville. We 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 go everywhere as far everywhere we can drive in a day because. None of the other churches will do it, so we've got to do our work in theirs too. We'd go over that racetrack in Daytona Beach 
There'd be 100,000 people going that race, and we could give out 40,000, 50,000 gospel tracts in five, six hours, 25 years ago. We go now, we, we can take 100 people and spread out at all the entrance to that racetrack and preach and hold out gospel tracts. If we give out 1,000 tracts in an afternoon, we're doing good. I go home, I'm, I'm so grieved. I'm not grieved that we didn't get to win souls. I'm not grieved that we didn't have great success to brag about. I'm grieved that I live in a country where even the good old racetrack fans in the deep south want nothing to do with the Holy Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's grievous. Jonathan was grieved that Saul hated David so much. How about you? How about you? I don't want to be a friend of this world. Verse 35 says, It came to pass in the morning (laughs) that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him. So here's what he decided. I love David. It's going to cost me a throne. It's going to cost me a kingdom. It's going to cost me riches. It's going to cost me wealth and honor. It's going to cost me a relationship with my own flesh and blood. I might be mocked and ridiculed, insulted. My mother's going to be insulted. They're going to throw a javelin at me and try to kill me. And first thing in the morning, I'm going to get up and go out in the field with David. You know what Jesus said? Harvest truly is plenteous. The laborers are few. The field is the world. The sower went forth to sow the seed. Here's my determination And I hope it's yours. The world doesn't want Jesus. Tomorrow, I'm going to go out in that world and tell somebody about Jesus. The nation's tired of the Bible. I'm going to open that Bible tomorrow and tell somebody the truth from the Word of God. We're just going to keep going to the field. Keep going to the field. And keep going to the field. And keep going to the field. The field might be your school. The field might be your job. The field might be your neighborhood. The field might be the store you're shopping in tomorrow. The field might be a a mission station somewhere. The field might be a pulpit in a church somewhere. But here's what I've determined. Brother Joel, we're going to find faith on the earth. Here's the only way we're going to find faith on the earth. I'm going to walk past the hatred and past the ridicule and past the scorning and past the insults and past the mockery. And I'm going to get up every morning and go in the field and meet King Jesus there and we're going to do what we can today. And the next day, we're going to go to the field. And the next day, we're going to go to the field. And that's, that's all we've been asked to do, and that's all we can do. Jonathan gave up a lot, but he gained more. Jonathan turned his back on his flesh and blood, his first birth, <laughs> but he's associated with somebody far better. I don't read about any great psalms written by Saul that people still sing today. I don't read about any, any, any place in the Bible where God used Saul to be the picture and example of how people get saved. He used David. He used David. So Jonathan made the right choice. Young man, young man, you probably got all kinds of opportunities to be somebody in this world. Be a Christian. Be a Christian. Young lady, Satan will offer you everything except the one thing that will satisfy you and make you truly happy. That's Jesus Christ. Be a Christian. Be a Christian.